Well, here we have an all new for 1967 Imperial convertible, not a Chrysler Imperial, but Imperial was its own make for Chrysler during these years up until the 1975 model year beginning in 1955 and then again from 1981 to 1983. The 67 cars were all new as I mentioned. They transitioned from body on frame to unibody and downsized a bit. The 66s rode atop 129 inch wheelbase. These are riding atop 127 inch wheelbase. You see the cool turn signal there with the Imperial logo and these kind of turbine vane wheel discs that are also quite handsome. But the real reason why this transition to unibody was that Chrysler could no longer justify a dedicated platform for Imperial as its sales had really sunk during the previous years. To the point that in 1966, only about 13, 14,000 Imperials were made. 1967 was a bit better sales year with oh, roughly about 15,000, 16,000 made only 577 convertibles were made. So this is one of 577. You can see in the back here, Imperial was taking on that kind of Cadillac-esque, very vertical theme of the rear quarter panels, although it does have also a very horizontal theme with the taillights. And this really cool centerpiece, which is where the gas fill is on these vehicles. So... It wasn't a great sales success for Chrysler during these years, and indeed, all the way until the late years in 1975, Imperial never really sold much over about 15,000 units a year, unfortunately. And it's a bit of a shame because it really was a pretty high-quality vehicle from Chrysler, but they were expensive. These vehicles were produced uh, in relatively limited quantities, but their prices were also quite high. You know, up into the Cadillac Plus territory. And I guess buyers just thought it was too much. And there's the look at the cool gun sight wind split molding and hood ornament. So as I mentioned, in 1967, there were 577 of these produced. They came standard with a 350 gross horsepower, 440 cubic inch high compression V8. So they scooted along really well, and they have a very handsome, understated, elegant interior. You can see here with the split bench front seat, and that is real wood trim. The radio is in the middle there of the dash, and you lift up a cover, and it's behind the cover. So something that's quite modern, at least you see that again today, but this Imperial had that. Really nice, tasteful door panels and wood trim all around the interior of the vehicle. This 1967 Imperial would be redesigned for the 1969 model year, so it only continued on for one more year after this. You can see it has a full complement of gauges as well, and this is the unlocking mechanism for the tilt and telescoping wheel there. You unscrew it, and then it moves in and out. Very comfortable seating, Neat door handle there with wood inlay on it. Somewhat unusual. Reminds me a bit of some of the crazy things Chrysler did to the later uh, non-imperial LeBarons in the late 70s, putting the vinyl on the top of the belt line molding. I don't know why it reminds me of that, but it does. And this was an Elwood Engel styled car. You can see very kind of slab-sided design much in the vein of the 1961 Continental, which he also uh, led the design for. Engel came to Chrysler after Virgil Exner was fired in the early 1960s for some of the debacles in the early 60s vehicles, including the 1962 Plymouth, which wasn't entirely his fault. Uh, he called those plucked chickens because they were forced to ride atop a smaller wheelbase than what he and the design team had really originally envisioned. When Engel arrived, he was hired by Chrysler because of the very clean look of the 1961 Lincoln. And you can see the inspiration here for sure in many different elements of the car. For instance, while this Imperial doesn't have the chrome moldings atop the fenders and the rear quarter panels and running down the door, it does have, you can see, very, very clean side sections with not much body sculpture, very Bauhausian design. Amazingly vertical rear quarters, similar to Cadillac in the era, but with no taillights in them. 
And as I mentioned before, the tail light is in that very horizontal assembly, giving the vehicle this wider look. It's got these horizontal themes to emphasize the overall width of the car and perhaps try to take away a little bit from the vertical themed rear quarters that would make it look a bit more narrow if that weren't there. Overall, in spite of the relatively little body side sculpture, I do think these Imperials are quite handsome and they were tastefully trimmed. I do think that one of the errors that Chrysler made is that they priced these vehicles really quite high. A comparable Cadillac DeVille for 1967 had a base price of $5,625. And the Imperial base price was a couple hundred dollars above that. So you can imagine it was a pretty big stretch for a buyer to say that, gosh, I want to pay the couple extra hundred dollars for a car that doesn't sell as much and doesn't have as great a resale value as the Cadillac. I think that that really hurt the Imperial. But I have driven these, and I will say that they do have a number of redeeming qualities. The first is this high compression 300 horsepower, sorry, 350 gross horsepower, 440 cubic inch V8. It really is a masterpiece in these vehicles and propels them with surprising alacrity. The 727 transmission is buttery smooth, much more so than the Fords of the year. The interior here with the wood trim, and I particularly love the door handles, how they're, you'll see in a second here, they're kind of this flat squarish thing protruding from the armrest. I think they're especially cool. And you know, overall, it is just a super tasteful vehicle. They don't have a mushy ride like the Fords of the era. They actually ride quite stiffly with the torsion bar front suspension and rear leaf spring setup. But you can see one of the reasons why this person probably bought this Imperial is uh, to tow something. This car has a tow hitch on it, this very car you're looking at right now. And the leaf spring rears, coupled with the high performance or premium fuel 440, really lent itself to towing, in spite of the fact that these cars were unibody. In fact, Chrysler, all the way through the early 70s, had some of the highest towing ratings around in the industry. You could tow 7,000 pounds with your Chrysler Town & Country wagon, and like I said, again, it was unibody. So overall, very handsome, uh, somewhat distinctive vehicle, maybe a little bit stiff, if you will, but I do think that they are you know, good-looking vehicles. They are not overly roly-poly. They handle well. They ride quite nicely. If you're looking for a more sporty riding luxury car, you might want to consider one of these. Hope you enjoyed that look at this 1967 Imperial. Thanks again for watching, and until next time, take care. Thanks again for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And until next time, check out the video thumbnails at bottom left and right for some suggestions for you.